Here we produce the best tobacco in the world. The words tobacco, puro, and cohiba, which are widely used in the tobacco vernacular of the cigar business, come from the native Indians which Christopher Columbus encountered when he first disembarked in Cuba. The word tobacco, which means cigar in Cuba, is the original word used by the Indians to speak of their cigars and not the tobacco plant as such. Later the cigar was described by the word puro in many areas of Europe, referring to its pure Havana origins. Havana is the capital city of the largest of the Caribbean islands. Also, Havana is to the cigar what Venice is to lovers. Here at the foot of this cathedral, designed at the time of the Spanish conquest, in these streets where there are as many types of skin colors as songs, a few rolled tobacco leaves seem to have given birth to a passion and an art, the Havana cigar. From the grand avenues to narrow alleyways, the city rings with the names of the first great factories, which developed the cigar into a perfect and luxurious commodity. Still very much alive, like Partagas or Cuesta Rey, or disappearing into history, like Romeo and Julieta, Hoyo de Monterrey, or La Legitimidad. A large number of these factories have given their names to the great international brands of cigar of our times. The existence of the others in the history of the Puro, small and forgotten, is witnessed only by a few images still to be seen on their cigar boxes. This is a history which began five centuries ago. The first encounter between the European and the cigar occurred between the 2nd and the 5th of December 1492 on the coast of the former province of Oriente de Cuba. Scarcely off the ship in Cuba, Rodrigo de Jerez, a companion of Columbus who went to explore the interior of this new territory, came across the Tainos Indians, natives of the island, who were carrying burning grass in their hands and inhaling its smoke. It was the origin of the cigar, a veritable fat cigar the size of a musket, to which the Indians attributed magic powers and which the conquistadors were about to adopt. On his return to Spain, Rodrigo de Jerez brought with him a few of these muskets, as the Indians used to describe these enormous cigars. One afternoon, when he was sitting in the courtyard of his house, he took one out and began to smoke it. However, nobody in Spain had ever seen a cigar. Nobody even knew of its existence, and that included Rodrigo's wife. But when she came out of the house and found Rodrigo smoking, she panicked and flew down the street, screaming that her husband had been possessed by the devil. The consequence was that Rodrigo de Jerez, the man who discovered the cigar in the New World, was sent to prison for two years by the Spanish Inquisition for being possessed by the devil and having emitted smoke from his mouth and sparks from his eyes. Very soon, magic turned to pleasure, and plantations began to develop in Cuba under the control of the Spanish crown, which bought the harvest from Cuba immigrants, now planters, right up to the 19th century, importing and processing the leaves in Spain. The main tobacco-growing regions of the island are the provinces of Oriente, of Remedios, of Partido, around Havana, 
Semivuelta, and finally at the extreme west, Vuelta Bajo, which surrounds the small town of Pina del Rio. The Vuelta a Bajo is divided into zones or vegas and is considered to be the mecca of the cigar. Here in this cheerful little valley dotted with tobacco drying sheds known as casas, they grow tobacco which has made Havana famous throughout the world. Each valley, by virtue of its soil and its exposure, produces tobacco of a different flavor, the most delicate coming from the San Luis and the San Juan y Martinez Vegas, in which the former plantation of Oyo de Monterrey, belonging to José Henner, gave its name to one of the great makes of cigar. Apart from a few state cooperatives, the planters, or vegueros, are the owners of small plantations of two to five hectares in the vicinity of villages whose lives are oriented around the life cycle of the tobacco plant. Powerful traditions influence this growing system, which is incompatible with expansion. Our family has always been involved in the production of cigar tobacco. Not only my father, but also my grandparents. We have always tried to hand down the plantation to the most enthusiastic member of the family, because the growing of cigar tobacco is a family undertaking. A tobacco plantation is like a garden. It needs attention every day. Although at 48, I'm not very old. I already know that my son will take over from me. The problem is that it is a business which cannot be learned in a year. In fact, one has to dedicate a good part of one's life to the plantation before one can claim to know something about it, because basically we know so little about tobacco. Here, tobacco is a winter plant. The schedule of the planter begins in the first two weeks of August with preparation of the ground. In this tropical climate, in temperatures reaching 40 degrees centigrade, the work begins at daybreak. This is the time of hard labor. Some locals, such as Alejandro Robaina, the largest viguero in San Luis, whom the Grama National Daily described as the best planter in the world, have their secrets. He never turns over the earth. He merely rolls it and leaves it to rest until seeding time. We encounter a lot of problems with tobacco seed because the sowing takes place in September when it is still very rainy. Many of the seeds are destroyed, and this spoils the rhythm of the sowings. If one is obliged to replant two or three times, these delays add up until one is no longer able to achieve the desired leaf quality when harvest time comes around. The tobacco seed, examined and selected by technicians at research centers, are supplied to the planters by representatives of the Cuba tobacco, who are scattered all over the Vuelta. Nowadays, in order to get around the problem of seed losses, which can occur due to seed sowing in the open ground, the experimental station is developing, a tray growing system which consists of growing seedlings under shelter in trays of sand, peel, rice, and earth. This system has many advantages. It improves the yield to 900 plants per square meter. The quality of the growth is also better, with more vigorous roots, and the plants are more resistant to diseases of all kinds. Diseases, storms, and the south wind which can wither the leaves, present a very serious threat to the grower of cigar tobacco. However, the main enemies are the insects, the worst of which is the virulent Bibi Hagua ant, which devours the buds or strips the leaves. The veguero spends much of his time trying to eliminate these. In mid-October, the young seedlings are planted, 
then partially unearthed in order to improve irrigation and growth, and will reach maturity toward the end of December. For the vegueros producing capes, the tobacco leaves which are used as the outer skin of the cigar, the aim of producing leaves of perfect quality, free of defects or marks, require that they be protected from the rigors of the sun. This is accomplished using tapados, or sunshades of muslin strung from stakes, introduced in 1903. Plantations under tapados make these valleys look like tropical snowfields. Protected in this manner, the result is known as tabaco tapado, as distinct from tobacco grown in the open air, which is less lustrous in appearance and destined for the internal bulk of the cigar. The plant can be divided roughly into three parts, the corona, the centro, and the libre de pi. The corona is the upper part of the plant, the part nearest to the sun. The centro is the intermediate part, and the libre de pi is the bottom part. If you look at a drawing of a tobacco plant, you notice that the central leaves are the largest, and in fact, these are the leaves of the highest quality and best texture. The corona leaves are young and still growing toward the sun. They are therefore smaller and of a softer, more delicate texture. Finally, the libra de pi, which are closest to the earth, are of lower quality, but are valued for their beauty and their size. In order to encourage maximum development of the foliage, a process of debudding is performed regularly. This consists of removing the buds which are hidden beneath the leaves and which weaken the plant. At the beginning of January, all the villages of the Vuelta organize themselves for the harvesting, which lasts from 60 to 80 days and is accomplished in several stages. The leaves of the Libre de Pi which are the first to mature, are harvested first, followed by the centros, and finally the coronas. Harvest time brings great joy to the planters of cigar tobacco. In Cuba, this has always been the pretext for a party. It is also the time when the planter is at his busiest and where he has to exercise the greatest care. The real motive for the party, however, is because this is when the planter is really feeling the happiest. Under the control of the veguero, who generally possesses his own tobacco casa or casas, the plant undergoes its first treatment. This is a drying process, which will last for 40 days. The leaves are stitched in pairs by women described as ensartadoras, and are then suspended from long poles of wood, which have been carefully prepared so that they will communicate no odor to the tobacco. They say that the tobacco is put on the slope to indicate this drying stage under the sloping roofs of the casas. The locals always say that one has to be a better planter in the drying shed than in the field. This is because drying is one of the most important stages of tobacco production. Tobacco which dries too quickly, for example, due to dry and cold weather from the north, 
dries to a green color. The world's markets tell us that this is not the quality which they are seeking. What we are aiming for is a more mottled water effect with a hint of pink. It is therefore necessary to make adjustments according to the weather by closing up the tobacco casa or drying sheds or adjusting the poles on which the tobacco hangs. And when it is dry, as it is today, the casas are open during the night to allow the humidity to enter, causing the tobacco to take on a more uniform color. Francisco Milian, a veguero from San Juan, relates that he has even slept with his tobacco at times of unfavorable weather in order to look after his precious harvest of cape leaves. If we are to be satisfied, then the leaf must possess all of the desired qualities. This length, that width, and this or that texture. It is a flawless tobacco leaf from which we can roll two good cigars for the export market and two more for consumption at home. I mention consumption at home because in the part of the leaf close to the main vein, the veining is a little too thick and rather visible, patterning the cigar, while in the best cigars such veining is barely perceptible. The locals frequently roll their cigars on the thigh, as I'm doing here, and this is the perfect way. It is a very natural thing for us to roll a cigar in this way, and it results in one of the best cigars in the world. Local people do it every day and can achieve a cigar which is as regular and cylindrical as one made on a factory production line. All I need now is a match, but I don't seem to have one at the moment. One morning at dawn, when the ambient humidity is quite high so that there is no danger that the leaves will crumble and move, the dried leaves are removed gathered into bundles, called metulis, and sent to one of the grading centers, the Escogidas, punctuating the Vuelta a Bajo. According to whether they provide the capes, the binders, the underskin of the cigar, or the insides of the cigar, the tobacco leaves now follow different processes. The production of each planter is carefully identified and weighed in order that payment can be assessed by Cuba Tobacco which centralizes the whole Cuba tobacco harvest. Before going to the selection stage, the leaves are humidified so that they can be handled. This is the mojado, which is repeated using several different methods during the whole process leading to the finished cigar. The matulis are opened up and fed progressively into the grating plant, where various grating operations succeed one another, the cape leaves being subjected to the strictest selection process. The know-how of the local people who carry out this work throughout the whole Vuelta is the heritage of the tobacco tradition. It is necessary to be able to detect with precision and at a glance differences in length and width of the leaves, all the nuances of color, and all of the possible imperfections. Touch is used to assess the fleshiness of the leaf, which determines its burning quality and its strength. The different tobacco strength classes, called tiempos, go from the weakest to the volado, the seco, and the ligero, which is the strongest and which plays a very important role in composition of the mixture which will give the cigar its unique taste. We are quite good at describing the leaves. It's as if we were discussing people as black, white, blonde, dark with blue eyes, and so on. Just imagine, there are no less than 40 different classes of leaf. Take the ligero, for example. There are four ligero classes, three pesado classes, etc. They are selected by their size, 
their texture and their color. And this adds up to over 40 classes in all. Close to the Escogida, one generally finds the desfalillo, which is the stripping plant. There, the leaves intended for the bulk of the cigar, or for the binder in which the insides of the cigar is first rolled, are cut back and selected. This cutting back process is designed to remove the thicker part of the central veining, which does not burn well and has a disagreeable taste. It is cut back using a tapered metal hook over a length which depends on the intended use of the tobacco. The inside leaves are generally cut back to the middle of the leaf, while those intended as binders are stripped only to the third or fourth vein, as they say in the language of Havana, referring to the small parallel veins of the leaves. Tobacco growing is a very complicated business. It needs a lot of care during all of the process and all of the time. It's a bit like a woman. You have to care for it, caress it even. It's the same with the tobacco. You have to handle it and rub it the right way while keeping a close watch on it. In order to discover if the next harvest will be a good one, the local will take a tobacco leaf before it is dried and roll it like this on his cigar. The man who knows his plantation well is able to make a good estimation of the quality of his future harvest. When this cutting back is finished, fermentation can begin for a period of 30 to 60 days, depending on strength. The leaves, mounted in stacks known as pilones, will lose the nitrogenous derivatives of which they are made. The temperature has to be checked regularly in order to prevent the tobacco from burning. The leaves are then assembled into smaller bundles and allowed to rest and dry slowly on parillas, which are huge open-work shelves and which are generally located in roof spaces of buildings. This year the harvest will be good. See how well it burns. When the tobacco is green, it does not burn like that. But this harvest will be a good one. It will be even better when it has dried. It is a drying which makes really good tobacco. Fermentation of the cape leaves takes place separately, frequently in Havana factories, to which they are transported under very special conditions to prevent them from being damaged. They are first assembled into gavillas, or bundles of 40 leaves of the same class, then into manoques of four gavillas, and finally packed in tercio, which is a cubic pack in yagua, the bark of a Cuban palm tree, which has the ability to conserve humidity and so to maintain the quality of the capes during their journey.
the journey to Havana. All of the leaves which have completed their first transformation must now make this trip in order to become cigars, and one day to ascend in smoke to Havana heaven, joining the spirits once called down by the Indians with the help of tobacco, and which even now are called down into their smokehouses by spirit-possessed cults which call themselves Afro-Cubans. Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venga hasta nosotros, tu reino, haga el Señor tu voluntad, si la tierra como el cielo. El pan nuestro de cada día, no hoy, pero no nuestras deudas, si nosotros perdonamos tu dolor, no nos dejen caer en tentación, libre nos sea tu amor, amén, Jesús, Marios. Llamo a mi madre y no me I call my mother, and she doesn't hear. I call my father, and neither does he. But I call my spirits, and they come to me. By and by. Arremar, arremar, harinero, la Virgen de Regla nos va a acompañar. Pago, Cintrea. quien llamo en este sabue. Eh, lupe, 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 Gracias. no puedan cantar. Si siete rayos esta se ve, se ve. Dice un buen entero que tienen todo lo que crearon de la tierra. Dicen que traiga uno un proquito de misericordia. Uno un pra. Uno misericordia. Y uno un desenvolvimiento. Dice a otro rato. Dice, niño, yo nada más que me llamo Victoria. Ahora arriba de la tierra. Debe ir a un crojón y como un palo que jura no tres y si tres y a un cuabajo. Un trámite, no la cara. Hay un chipata. Partagas, La Corona, Upman, El Laguito, Costa Rey, Rey del Mundo. On their arrival in the great factories of Havana, the Cape tobacco leaves are put through the preparatory processes necessary to enable them to be handled and rolled into the cigars. The manokis are separated, and the leaves are unfolded one by one for further humidification. In each factory, two escogidas and despeleos plants are used to process the first cape leaves from the grading operation at the plantations. Selection is performed in accordance to the needs of the factory and with the models or shapes of cigars which it produces. These models are referred to by the cigar makers as vitoles. According to its size, each leaf can be used to enclose this vitole or that, bearing names such as Mareva or Carolina and not those used by the cigar smokers. Si <laughs> 
The crucial moment in preparing the tobaccos which go into the making of a cigar is that of the weighing, where the mixture or the ligas are established, giving the cigar its strength and its flavor. In the tobacco growing industry, the names of the different types of leaves of which the liga is composed include volado, seco and liguero. These are the leaves which give the cigar its good burning quality, its special flavor and its particular characteristics. The proportions and the origin of each of these leaves are a closely guarded secret. This is the great mystery which each manufacturer takes with him to his grave, but which he passes on to his successor when he retires. The galley is the work area of the cigar rollers, the torcedores. The old torcedores like to say that the galley is a noisy popular theater where the actors are dancing faces and hands and where every instant sees the birth of another great puro. To create a cigar, the torcedoro places the various classes of leaves in front of him. Then he cuts the leaves in half to make the binder. He then collects the volado, seco, eligero leaves, which will form the body of the inside of the cigar, estimating their volume and the homogeneity of the cylinder to be created. He then rolls these in the binder into what is called the doll. Now this doll, the head of which is marked by the stroke of the chavetta, the indispensable knife of the torcedore, is then placed in the molding block in which it takes on its perfectly cylindrical shape. With the cigar in place, the molding block is tightened and left for about 20 to 30 minutes, during which time the torcedore carries out several similar operations in parallel. There was a time when this profession, which requires the intuition of a cook and the dexterity of a magician, was passed on from father to son. It was in the family workshop that this craft was learned. I began in this business because my brother and three friends set up a sort of cigar-making plant. They used to work at night time. From 8 to 11 p.m., when the work was starting, they made cigars. I was 12 or 13 then, and I used to go with them. This is how I learned the skills of cigar making, how to cut back the outer leaf, the cape, how to apply the band, and how to pack the finished products. I discovered all this little by little, and also learned how to make my own cigars. Nowadays, every factory has its own school in the corner of the galley, where the apprentice torcedores attend their classes. Apprenticeship lasts for nine months, but if the student is talented and reaches the level of a good cigar roller in a shorter time, he is assessed accordingly. The length of the apprenticeship is therefore determined by the teacher.
Vem bonita pra parari, para, 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 para. On leaving the molding block, the doll is then rolled in a half leaf of superior texture, the cape. The finish on the head of the cigar, the part which is held in the smoker's mouth, requires cutting with great skill and care. This is what endows the cigar with its virginal perfection. And when it is opened and placed in the smoker's mouth, it will have to be capable of withstanding his bite. A flavorless vegetable gum is used to supply this quality. Finally, a disc of tobacco inserted like an exclamation mark closes off the cigar at its foot. El pez. Let's look at the weight and the thickness of the cigar, or vitola, because it has to pass through the cepo. Do you know what the cepo is? The cepo is a block with a hole of cigar diameter. The cigar must pass through this hole without tearing. The weight also is important. If the cigar is too heavy, this means that it contains too many tobacco leaves and is therefore too tight. If it is too light, this means that it is too loose and will smoke very badly. These are the things which are difficult to judge. One of the most astonishing features of the Tosidori workshops is the custom of reading to the rollers twice each day. The morning session is usually devoted to reading the newspaper and the afternoon session to a novel. In this case, Elsa Triolet's Roses on Credit is read a little each day. This reading custom began at the request of the Torsidores in 1866 in the El Figaro factory in Havana and enabled the workers in the factories to improve themselves as they worked and to develop their social conscience, thus creating the first workers' mutual aid association. Es el momento crucial de una vida conyugal. El escollo peligroso. Si se lo salva, salvo. Pues eran 20,000 francos lo que quería el y el resultado de esto fue que con el transcurrir de los años... The result of this is that over the years, cigar rollers have come to be considered as the most cultivated of the Cuba working class. There is even a funny anecdote from the 30s of a famous Havana judge who specialized in disputes between workers and their bosses. Whenever he heard a case between a cigar roller and a boss, or a factory, he always used the expression, it's very difficult to proceed against the advocates of the devil, because that was how cigar rollers were known at the time, advocates of the devil. A highly praiseworthy trade, don't you think? Quality control of the Havana cigar is conducted by poles taken in the galley, but also at all stages of the packing process. The classification of cigars by their color, which is used in order to assemble boxes of cigars all the same color, is a visual skill. There may well be differences of opinion between one selector and another, but there are no less than 70 different possible shades. Since one cigar was sometimes difficult to distinguish from another in the last century, manufacturers introduced the banding of cigars in order to mark their production. History accords credit for this innovation to Gustav Bloch, the Dutch Havana marketing company. The invention of lithography enabled the hundreds of cigar makers of the time in Cuba to apply these bands, 
and these greatly added to the fame of the Havana worldwide. They very quickly latched onto an excellent marketing strategy by decorating their cigars with the faces of very well-known smokers, kings, or politicians. No select club in the world could resist the temptation to have a Havana cigar carry its crest. These days, cigar aficionados prefer a more sober and less ostentatious presentation in the form of a bundle of 50 cigars held by a simple and elegant ribbon of silk. The cedar boxes in which the Havanas are shipped are often decorated on the outside and the inside with small pictures known as vistas. This operation is carried out in the filetaro plant, where the boxes are sealed after filling with a paper seal to prevent the cigars from drying out. It is generally agreed that Alones was the first manufacturer to employ a luxurious vista or landscape for the production of his wares, though there is no historical proof of this. In any case, Alone was one of the precursors of this technique and one of those who created the most brilliant and luxurious vistas for his cigar boxes. He was also one of the first, if not in fact the first, to make use of the pan de oro or gilding of the leaf. As one sees on a vista of the time, these gilded medallions are in gold leaf. Vistas and cigar bands are veritable works of art in their way of telling the story of the puro and have become collector's items. This hobby is known as Vito Fili. Since the 70s, in the basement of an old mansion in Havana, Orlando Arteaga has been collecting all of the artifacts which the now vanished cigar factories produced in their time and heads a small business, La Vitola, which is the Alibaba's cave of collectors the world over. Collectors exist in a large number of countries. Spain is one, for example, where these are very common. France, too. But they are also common in Great Britain, the United States, Belgium, Holland, and even Japan. Here we have more than 3,000 different bands. These are the ones which sell themselves. There must be more than 300 different vistas. But I must repeat that this is only a small part of what has been produced in Cuba over the years. There are some which sell for as much as $700 or $800, and even more than $1,000 at times. The time has come for the cigars to leave the busy atmosphere of the factory and to travel to the luxurious display cabinets of the tobacconists. The seal of guarantee and the Habano strip certify the purity and quality of the hand manufacture, Echo Amano. In a few large factories, such as Partagas or La Corona, cigar shops present large selections of cigars for the tourists. At these outlets, demonstration torsadores show the visitors the secrets of cigar rolling. These are the elite of the torcedores, selected from the rolling galleys because of their absolute control over mixture and aromas. The pinnacle of success for the torcedore is for cigar aficionados to order directly from them cigars made exactly to their taste. Rodolfo Taboada, a torcedore of the Palacio del Tabaco, at the factory La Corona, is such a man. I have good customers. I have customers who are businessmen, French chefs, lawyers, and even Spanish politicians. Good customers.
I believe that rolling a cigar is an art. This is an art which, from Havana to Europe, is also a way of life. And its ambassadors, such as the house of Gerard and Sons in Geneva, aim to pass on this voluptuous message. The cigar aficionado takes great pleasure in discovering new aromas, new perfumes, new opulence. You could say that nowadays we have a whole family of mouth products. Although 15 years ago the majority of Cuban cigars tended to be rather powerful, rich, coarse, and even at the limit of what one could tolerate, and were famous for it, one can now obtain Havanas which are far milder, Havanas which are much cooler, or Havanas which offer much more agreeable aromas. It's a huge step forward in my opinion. The smoke from the Havana cigar is like music the tone of which is different for each individual cigar. The Corona and smaller half Corona are the two cigars which have been most appreciated by Havana aficionados over the years. This is a cigar which one can really appreciate when one is in the mood for it, a break from work, during a stroll, or after a light lunch. The big competitor of the half Corona, if one can so describe it, will always be the Corona. This is a cigar with the same characteristics as the half Corona, but with a bit more endurance, enabling the cigar lover to enjoy his pleasure for a longer time. And one could say that this is a highly valued item. These are perhaps the two most popular cigar sizes which are represented in virtually all of today's brands of Cuban cigars. The Great Panatella is the Apollo of the Havana. These cigars are known for their finesse and length. They are very slim cigars and they gave the lover of the Cuban cigar a great deal of pleasure during the 60s. They were intended mostly for after dinner and in the evening and were always taken along on outings. The larger examples which we can see, such as the double corona, which is no less than 19 centimeters or over 7 inches long, and 2 centimeters or almost an inch in diameter, were about at the limit of what one could manage for several reasons. One did not usually have the time, and they could prove to be quite tiring for the smoker. Twenty years ago they were virtually unknown. One of the best-loved cigars, which belonged to a group which one could describe as generous and very open, is the Robusto. This cigar of rather chubby appearance is very much appreciated by aficionados, often of the same demeanor, who like the gentle or generous fragrances, though one can also find fragrances which are much more powerful and heady in certain brands. The soul of the Havana has been founded on these cigars, on these tastes, these flavors, their opulence and oiliness, their woody and slightly stronger and spicier side. All this adds up to the realm of the Havana cigar. A garden of Eden, a center of desire and nurture. The Havana is a living creation which has to be kept and prepared in maturing rooms in which the human environment of its birth is recreated to allow it to improve and develop its aromas. Every 60 days we carry out checks in the maturing sheds until such time as this maturing process has reached its peak. We try to catch the cigar at the peak of condition, which when we present it will make it the Prince of Princes. The architecture of the Havana can be described in three parts. The first part, which we will call the foot, the second, known as the body, and the third called the head. 
These three parts play a very important role in the flavor of the product. Why is this? Well, simply because at the beginning, if the cigar tends to start with a flavor which is gentler and cooler, then as one enters into the body of the cigar, its aromas are more appreciated. In the jargon of the cigar world, this is described as the hay, the divine, and the manure. Like the great vintage wines, cigars can attract very high prices. Havana. What mysterious power you have over those possessed by this unreasoning passion. Thank you very much. Thank you. To describe the perfect burn of a Cape leaf, the Vegueros of the Vuelta say that it burns a la vela. Burning a la vela. Look, that's it. Unbelievable. See how well it smokes. This is what we call burning a la vela in Cuba. With good tobacco, it burns a la vela. <laughs> Mira, mira qué tabaco tan bueno, mira.